Live testimony in the Stanley Liggins murder case out of the Quad Cities in Iowa in the death of a nine-year-old girl back in 1990. Ashley Wilcott is with me here in the studio in New York to break this case down. Ashley, a lot to talk about here. He said that when he was on the scene, he smelled what he thought was gasoline, but tests were ultimately inconclusive on the accelerant. Is this a case where the jury just has to go by what the witness said he observed at the scene? I think in this particular case, that's going to be helpful to have the testimony that, yes, he actually smelled it at the scene. But I don't think they're going to discount that it was inconclusive testing. So all of that has to come together. And again, this is a very circumstantial case. So it's going to be a lot of little pieces put together to show it was this defendant who committed the crime. Okay. Long pause between the discovery of the poor nine-year-old girl's body and the search of the broader scene. They found her in an evening and then another day goes by and they're looking around in the scene where the body was discovered and then he heads home probably because he was up all night doing the investigation the first evening and on the third day is when they start to search the broader school grounds is that too long of a pause in your opinion i don't think it is so long as they found evidence and they're now going to connect that evidence to the actual crime in this defendant but with that you know we have to see what the remainder of his testimony is in that regard i was very impressed with the investigation once they got there and how thorough they thought about not likely they went over the fence so we're going to look on this side first for evidence and some of those things he testified to a lot of the prosecution's questioning in this case sort of bounces around a little bit. You know, they they make a point and then they bring some more evidence in and make a point and it gets a little bit hard to follow. I wish they would just sort of get the evidence in and then make the key points because it helps the jury uh, make sense of things. But testimony is going to continue along here in the Stanley, Lig Stanley Liggins case. We will be back for more live testimony in just a couple of minutes. But first, folks, important program note this afternoon on Law and Crime. Chief Investigative Reporter Brian Ross bringing you a special report, 9-11, Are We Safer? He will break down the big questions this anniversary of 9-11, including whether the war in Afghanistan was a success whether justice is truly being served with detainees at Guantanamo Bay and how the people still suffering from the after effects of 9-11 are fighting for their health and fighting for their legal rights. That's this afternoon from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern here on Law and Crime. We will be right back with more live testimony in the Liggins case in a moment. Morning break has been called in the Iowa murder trial of Stanley Liggins. He's facing a number of charges, including causing willful injury, kidnapping, sexual assault, arson, and ultimately murder. Authorities say that's the trajectory of the final hours of a nine-year-old victim named Jennifer Ann Lewis. Ashley Wilcott is here with me in studio here at the Law and Crime headquarters in New York City to break this case down. We heard a lot of forensic evidence, or at least attempts to create forensic evidence in this case, but it really doesn't bring us any closer to this particular defendant. Not at all. And so, Aaron, I'm just, uh, you know, watching all of this, we've gone through tedious details with the questioning about all of the evidence, where fingerprints were taken, what they looked for, and the conclusion in every one of these examples has been not conclusive, or we found nothing to connect the defendant to this victim. So, so far, this has basically said, hey, we have found nothing to connect him to the victim. Exactly. Okay. Now, there are a couple of big pieces of evidence here, and one of them is that the defendant, during an interrogation, which, oh, by the way, the recording equipment crashed and didn't properly <laughs> record it, but right. the bottom line is there was an interrogation. We wish we had a recording of it. We don't. But the defendant backpedaled and then admitted that he lied to police. Why was he lying? Was he lying because he was dealing cocaine, or was he lying because he committed this crime? Well, we don't know. That's the point. It's such a circumstantial case. And in addition, don't forget, in 1991, there was a conviction of him sexually assaulting another nine-year-old, different nine-year-old child. And so how does that play into his motive for lying? We don't know. We don't know. There's a lot of what-ifs in this case. The DNA tests ultimately led nowhere. The tests on the fibers led nowhere. We've got fingerprints, and I think that there was one of them that wasn't either the defendant or one of his associates. Was that the one, and I was trying to make the link when we were cutting in and out of the breaks there, was that the one that they said was not suitable for identification. That got buried in there. And then the next question is, why was it not suitable for identification? You've got to explain that to the jury in the moment. Why not suitable for identification? Right, and I think we've talked about there are different ways to present evidence when you are trying a case. And as a trial attorney, you have to do it in a way that really makes it as um, 
easy for the jury to accept whatever your theory of the case is. And I think this could be presented in a different way to say exactly that. It was smudged. It wasn't legible. Whatever the reason is, so they get it right there in one neat little package of this is why we couldn't test that. I don't see that happening in some of the techniques that the prosecution's using in this case. Yeah, I mean, some of this goes back to basic trial advocacy. And I use little euphemisms that my trial advocacy professor taught me when I was in law school. And one of them is the gold coin euphemism that I use earlier. Sometimes in a circumstantial case, you just have to drop little gold coins, little gold nuggets mm -hmm. here and there, and then jurors hopefully are picking up on them in the display of evidence and whatnot. And the end, they put them together and say, we've got a pot of gold here. This points to a particular outcome or conclusion. Here, I don't even know if the prosecution is making those links as well as the prosecution could. Is the hope that they're just going to confuse this jury into a conviction? I hate to say that, but I, I have to wonder, like, what is the relevance of some of this evidence? Why are we going through all these steps? I don't know. I almost feel like the prosecution's being too cautious. They know that this conviction has been overturned twice. This is the third time they're trying this case. I almost feel like they want to be so cautious to make sure everything's on the record so there's absolutely no grounds for the Court of Appeals to overturn that they're just throwing everything out there. In terms of trial advocacy skills, the other thing they could do is use head notes with the questions that they ask and simply say, now I want to talk about the car and fingerprints. Yes, exactly. You have to roadmap, signpost, yes. and say this, okay, we've talked about the fibers, let's talk about the subsequent DNA test. And look, in theory, it's a leading question, but nobody objects to those kind of questions because it's helping the jurors understand where the testimony is going. And both sides normally should be doing this. Absolutely. That's good trial advocacy. And then it does what you described of using the gold coins to say, okay, this is each piece that we're going to look at and put together. And that's just missing in this case. So it just sounds very convoluted is all. Look, we're talking about the Stanley Liggins case in Iowa. We don't want to get lost too far in the weeds, though. Let's take a look at the broader picture and get you caught up to speed on the top crime headlines of the day. We're back talking about the Stanley Liggins case from the Quad Cities in Iowa. One interesting point that came up this morning is that there's some evidence of transfer of heroin fibers between the victim, the daughter, and her father. Now, Ashley, is that enough for the defense to try to wiggle in here? Wait a minute. This shouldn't be written off as evidence. I absolutely would argue that because the testimony was it doesn't mean that there was just contact and it doesn't mean that he did something to her. There's no way to know which of those it means. So I would use that as the defense. You know, that's an interesting possibility. We have to wait and see where the defense is going to go. The defense did not give a clear opening statement. That might come at the beginning of the defense case in chief. I'm signing off. Ashley, I know you're going to sit here and <laughs> yes, take the sir. host chair. So stick around. We will be back after this quick break with more analysis of the Stanley Liggins case in Iowa. I will see you later on.